Good morning once again and welcome to Confessors of Christ Church. We just had the great opportunity to worship through music, and now we're going to continue that worship through God's Word this morning. And we're going to do it a little differently this morning than what is standard for what we normally do here. Normally, we'll look at a book of the Bible, and we'll go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, uh, paragraph through paragraph through the entire book. Uh, But this morning, we're going to pause and do something a little different for the next three weeks, where we're going to take a topic, and we're going to look at the breadth of Scripture about that topic to come to a better understanding of what it is that we seek to understand. And so what I'd like us to do this morning is I'd like us to kind of travel back in time. I'd like us to go back 2,000 years and pretend that we are with the disciples. I want us to imagine that instead of in a school cafeteria this morning, I want us to imagine that we are gathered around a table with the disciples. And Jesus himself is right there with the disciples, and he's talking to the disciples, and he's sharing about what has happened and what is to come. But something troubling is being shared during this particular time, something that the disciples were not ready to hear, something that they didn't want to hear, something that greatly saddened them as well, because Jesus was talking as if his time was drawing near to an end. Jesus was sharing around this table that there'd be a time when he would no longer be with his disciples. And imagine what it would have felt like sitting around that table with those disciples, knowing that you spent the last three years of your life with this rabbi. You were learning, you were discovering, you were going and doing, you were being a part of bringing forth the kingdom of God. And then your your rabbi, your leader, the one that you have been following, says words that, that you don't understand. He says this, Jesus speaking says, I have said these things to you, that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Imagine what the disciples were to think when they hear these words. It's to your advantage that you go away. I mean, in what reality, in what situation, in what time would it ever be okay that Jesus were to go away? I mean, the Son of God who clothed himself in humanity is now standing before us, and he's telling us it's to our advantage that he goes away. This would be very troubling, I could imagine, for the disciples. But let me ask you a question, and maybe a question that you haven't pondered before, or maybe spent very little time pondering. A hypothetical question, but if you were told to have a choice, if you were given a choice, if you could have Jesus on earth, somewhere on earth, but actually have Jesus here with us today, would you choose to have Jesus here, or would you choose to have the Holy Spirit here? If you think about that for a second, what would you choose? Now, many of us would instinctively say, well, how awesome would it be to have Jesus here with us? I mean, that would be amazing. If Jesus was on the earth today, how incredible that would be. However, Jesus gives us the answer to that, and it's one that that may even shock us today. He says that it is to your benefit that I should go and send a helper. He continues talking to his disciples in this way. He says, For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, and therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
So this morning, we are going to start a three-part series on this helper, this Holy Spirit. And there is no way that we're going to be able to exhaust the fullness of who the Holy Spirit is in three weeks, let alone an entire lifetime if we were to spend the rest of our life just searching and understanding the scriptures on who the Holy Spirit is. We will not be able to do that. However... We are going to take the next three weeks to take a look, a closer look at who the Holy Spirit is. Now, over the course of church history for the past 2,000 years, the church has had an understanding through the scriptures that have been revealed to us who the Holy Spirit is. But there's always been different groups and different times, people trying to come in and give a different understanding or a different reasoning for the Holy Spirit or who the Holy Spirit is or what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, about 200 years ago, or maybe a little less, there was a group that has come about that completely changed the way that we thought about the Holy Spirit. It's a group that I will call a cult only because it takes Christianity and it distorts what has been known for the Christianity through God's word to be something different, and that is the group called the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they looked at the Holy Spirit differently than what the church has for 2,000 years. They looked at the Holy Spirit as a force. And this is something that they use to, that God the Father uses to make things happen, this force. And I've done really, really well to not use any Star Wars illustrations, but I'm going to fail miserably at this point. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is not a force that one can grow to learn and understand and use. The, Baby Yoda is not sitting there with the Holy Spirit going like this, or the child for those who like that as better, but does not sit here and, and make things happen with his mind and, and utilizes this force and the way uh, to make things happen. That is not what we see through the Bible. But there's also been a group that would say that really what the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is Jesus in spirit form. Like Luke Skywalker in episode 8 when he dies. I'm sorry if this ruins anything. But how when Luke Skywalker dies and he becomes a spirit form, that it's really just Jesus in spirit form that is now going about and doing all of these things. However, the Bible doesn't present that either as what the Holy Spirit is or who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is a person or an entity all to himself. We see in John that the Holy Spirit is referred to as a he. The verses that I was just sharing about the upper room and how we were gathered around the disciples, Jesus is actually referring to this helper, this Holy Spirit, as he. And actually, if we look through all the translations of the Bible for the last 2,000 years, all the translators have looked at it as the same way, as a person, as an entity, as he. This isn't saying that the Holy Spirit took on flesh, and we need to understand that. It's not saying that the Holy Spirit took on flesh, and that's why we call him a person. No, it's saying that the Holy Spirit is an entity separate from the Father and separate from the Son. But maybe we should ponder this question, and maybe you haven't thought of this question either. How do we know the Father is a person? How do we know that Jesus, the Son, is a person? Something we don't really think about that often. Justin Taylor, who is the vice president of Crossway Publishing, uh, he's the one that publishes the ESV Bible translation. You're welcome to use any uh, Bible translation here. We preach from the ESV or the English Standard Version. And the vice president of the publishing company says this, The reason we know the Father and the Son as a person is that the Bible presents a person as a substance that can do personal and relational things. And that's how we know it's a person such as speaking or thinking or feeling or acting, something that does these personal things in relationship would constitute a person. So like God, like angels, like human beings would be a person. So let's see if we see the personhood of the Holy Spirit using this understanding of speaking and thinking, feeling and acting. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put up verses on the screen here above us. Uh, you may be a Jedi when it comes to opening your Bible. I told you I was going to keep going. I'm sorry. Uh, when it comes to flipping through your Bible. Uh, but we're going to have them up here because we're going to go through them very quickly. And Andrew, our amazing technician back there, was going to give me a clicker. And he hasn't. So now he gets to do all this. And I'm really excited for him uh, to journey. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Scripture uh, in the New Testament. We're going to see if we can find the personhood of the Holy Spirit in this. Andrew, you ready? 
No? Okay, here we go. Let's begin by looking at John chapter 14, verse 26. Perfect. It says this, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2.13 says this, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. These first two verses, we see that the Holy Spirit not only teaches, but the Holy Spirit reminds. These are two things that the Holy Spirit does. Let's look at Acts chapter 8, verse 29. It says, the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Acts chapter 13, verse 2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So check this out. We see the Holy Spirit teaching and reminding, and now we see the Holy Spirit speaking. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 15, 28. It says this, it seems good to the Holy Spirit. So this, this thing that's about to happen seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And now we see the Holy Spirit making decisions. Let's look at Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And here we discover that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. What else can the Holy Spirit if he can be grieved, what else? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. And it says this, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has outraged the spirit of grace? So the Holy Spirit can be grieved and the Holy Spirit can also be outraged. What about Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the Holy Spirit can be lied to. Did you know that the Holy Spirit can also forbid or prevent human speech and plans? Check out what we have here in Acts 16, uh, verses 6 and 7. It says this, They went through the region of Phygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came up to Messiah, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So the Spirit actually, the Holy Spirit actually forbid them and actually prevented human speech and plans. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So now we see the Spirit comprehending even the thoughts of God. The Spirit also divides and allocates spiritual gifts. And this is one that is talked about a lot in the church because it's so helpful to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says, The same Spirit apportions spiritual gifts. That's what Paul is talking about here. The same Spirit apportions spiritual gifts to each one individually as he wills. So the Spirit then divides and is now allocating spiritual gifts. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so now we see the Spirit helping us. We see the Spirit interceding for us, and we see that the Spirit has a mind. This is one of, the, one of my favorite aspects of the Spirit. The Spirit also bears witnesses to believers about their adoption. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, it's, it's amazing. And we would, should rejoice with great joy if God, though we were rebelling against him, were to make it away so that we would no longer be recipients of his wrath, but just be okay. 
That would be amazing. Or if he would make us okay with him and then we would be able to then just work alongside him and do what he has called us as workers for him. That would be incredible. But that is not what God did. He has also made us children, sons and daughters of God himself. And that the Holy Spirit helps us with our soul in check with the Holy Spirit to understand that we are in fact children of God. And it's an incredible thing that the Holy Spirit does for us. But the Holy Spirit also bears witness to Christ. Let's look at John 15 and six, uh, verse 16. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And so the Spirit bears witness about who Christ is, the Messiah. Let's do one more. John 16, 14. The Spirit will glorify Christ, takes what is Christ and declares it to believers. Let's see that. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and he will declare it to you. And so we see the spirit doing uh, that of the glorification or giving glory to Christ, taking what is Christ and then declaring that to all the believers. What we have discovered by examining scriptures about the Holy Spirit He is most definitely not a force and most definitely not Jesus in spirit form. The Holy Spirit is his own person and his own entity. But what else is the Holy Spirit? So if we understand the Holy Spirit as his own person, his own entity, what else do we understand about the Holy Spirit? Well, we see that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, holy. And I guess that would go without saying, like, oh, that's kind of an obvious thing, right? But what does that mean? What does it mean that the Spirit of God is holy? It means that he is separate, he is distinct, he is other, he is unique, he is righteous. Holy is the Holy Spirit. He's also holy because the Holy Father and the Holy Son are sending forth the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 that we already spoke about says, And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you. So the Father is going to be sending forth the Holy Spirit. But John 16, 7 also talks about what the Son does. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit is nothing like us at all. You see, the Holy Spirit is invisible, and yet all of us here are very visible. I mean, you can look around and you can see us. Yeah, we're very visible here, but the Holy Spirit is invisible. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts, yet we are a people that are constantly seeking gifts, and we desire gifts, and we need gifts from the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is the gift giver. It's the Holy Spirit who guides and directs us. And we are a people and a group that needs desperately guidance and direction. The Holy Spirit transforms us and ignites our hearts. Without him, we are what the Bible calls a heart of stone. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are spiritually dark and capable of pleasing God. Yet it is the Holy Spirit who then gives us life and transforms us and ignites us. And of course, the Holy Spirit seals us and is our guarantor. We, if left to ourselves, we would, we would ruin everything. And we would. That's just in our nature. That's what we do. We ruin things. If we had the opportunity to lose our salvation, we would because we're really good at messing things up. But the Holy Spirit doesn't allow that. We would make a complete mess of everything. But it's the Holy Spirit that seals us and is our guarantor. So we see the Spirit of God is not only a person and an entity, but we also see the Spirit of God as completely and totally and fully holy. And so lastly, the Holy Spirit is this. Lastly, the Holy Spirit is fully God. You see, there's certain attributes of God that God has that mankind or humanity doesn't have. And then there's certain attributes that God has that we have in very limited form. We have love. We have mercy. We have grace. 
We can invoke justice. Uh, we can invoke wrath. Anybody that drives I-4 during this time of year understands what that wrath can be. Uh, but we don't do it perfectly or rightly, and we can do it in limited effects. However, the Holy Spirit also has attributes, and we see that the Holy Spirit has attributes that are not anything that any created being has. See, we see here in the scripture that the Holy Spirit is in all places at all times, omnipresent, a characteristic of God himself and not any of God's creation. Check out Psalm uh, chapter 139, verse 7 and 8. It says this, Where shall I go from your spirit? And where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take on wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And that is amazing. The Spirit is in all places at all times. And it's good to understand that when we see something like that, it helps us understand that the Holy Spirit is God because everything that is created does not have that ability. And this may be shocking or uh, it may be something against what you've thought or maybe you knew this, but we oftentimes will say it uh, unknowingly or unmistakenly or just kind of shout it out. But Satan himself, the evil one, the evil doer, the Satan, depending on how you want to classify him, is not in all places at all times. Actually, we see in Job that he goes to and from the earth. He is a created being. We see angels are not able to be in all places at all times. And so oftentimes we'll say something like, oh, well, Satan has been torturing me today or Satan has been really at me or hurting or Satan has really done this in my life and it's been really upsetting me. Um, not to you know, say anything that, that's hurtful or anything, uh, but I know I'm not that important. More likely, you may not be that important. So I doubt Satan himself is actually torturing you. However, let me, let me explain that. It doesn't mean that he's not real and he's not out there doing great and, and horrific things and working things in a certain way. But the aspect of it is, is that because we live in a fallen and broken world that Satan first used in the Garden of Adam and Eve, where he had them and deceived them in the fruit, we live now in a fallen and broken world. We live in an area with filled with death and destruction. And we see that all over the place, we have things that are happening to us and things that are happening around us that we see are the effects of what has happened, effects of what the deceiver has done. And we experience them. Though it is not Satan himself that is physically doing them, it's the result of his work in this world that is making these situations happen for us. But praise God that he is not able to be in all places at all times. You see, also the Holy Spirit, we see the Holy Spirit is omniscient. I mean, the Holy Spirit knows all things. This is something that is only by God and not by any created thing. There's no created thing that knows all things. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches out everything, even the depths of God, and no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. I mean, we also know that we are a spirit, or excuse me, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And so we can see that God knows our thoughts and knows our feelings and knows our emotions because the Holy Spirit dwells within all believers within inside of ourselves. And see, thankfully, for, to give a comparison, Satan does not dwell within our minds, and he does not control our thoughts. Really, when, you're, when you think that or say, man, Satan is really messing with my brain right now— I hate to break it to you. No, you're just that evil. You're just that bad. You just got that messed up thoughts. No, I, really, the idea, though, is that we are a fallen and broken people that because of sin riddling every ounce and every aspect of our body, our minds and our thoughts are wicked. And that's why we need a Savior. See, our thoughts and our minds are anti against God. We don't need Satan getting into our mind because we do it perfectly fine ourselves. And so when we think about all the things that goes through our thoughts and our minds and all the things we struggle with, we're actually struggling with what the Bible calls our own flesh. Now, there is one thing that is true. 
the more you get to know somebody, the more you understand why they think what they think, why they do what they think. The longer I get to understand my wife, the more I'm going to know how she thinks, why she talks, why she does things. If you've been married uh, for 30, 40 years, you'll find out, as I've been told, that it's, it's an amazing thing. Now imagine Satan has been on this earth for thousands of years, and we're pretty, we're pretty, we do the same things over. I mean, we, we create the same mistakes over and over. Look at our history, and we do the same things over and over. So while Satan is not in our head, he knows because of what we do and how we act and our, our nature and our tendencies. So he knows the things that we're going to do because he's experienced uh, for thousands of years what humanity does. But may that also encourage you this morning that, wow, Satan is very limited, that he has not the ability to be in all places at one time, that he doesn't know all things. May that encourage you that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is with each and every believer residing with us. The Holy Spirit knows our thoughts and is helping us to sanctify ourselves, to help us become more and more like Jesus, working on ourselves, become more like the way that God has designed us to be. And that is an incredibly good news. So the Spirit of God is a person, an entity. He is also holy. He is also the very essence and being God. But we can come to a very important moment in today's message. Why do we need to know this? Why, why does it, what does knowing that the Holy Spirit is a person and entity, that he is holy and he is God, what is that going to do for me? How is that going to change my life? How is that going to help me through this situation? What does knowing this information, great, now I understand it, but what does that really mean? Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 through 24 says this. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. <clears throat> let not the mighty man boast in his might. <clears throat> let not the rich man boast in his riches. But hear this. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and he knows me, that I am the Lord. You see, the beginning of all wisdom is to know God. You want to, to have wisdom, you want to have purpose, you want to have meaning, then we need to know who God is. If you want to be wise, know God. If you want to know how to get through the deepest hole in the darkest of times, you need to know who God is. If you want to know the meaning of life, that ultimate question, know God. If you want to know happiness and understand sadness and you want to have a worldview that, that understands and reconciles everything, then you need to know God. If you want eternal joy, know God. God is not just the Father, not just the Son, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one, united in essence and united in being. The more we know God, the more we will glorify him the more we will honor him and the more we will fall in love with him. One of the things that's so important is that we're going to spend the rest of our lives understanding the gospel or the good news about who Jesus is. The more we understand it, the more we understand what we've been rescued from, what we've been rescued to, the more we're going to fall in love with who God is. And we're going to spend the rest of this life falling more and deeper and fuller in love with God. And even for all of eternity, as we discover more and more about who God is, we will fall more and more in love with God. But we must be careful, we must be careful not to create a God in our own image. We must be careful to seek the scriptures to understand who God is. I've had the opportunity to talk to many believers over the years, and sometimes when I'll talk to them, as they're telling me about who God is to them, I find out something that's very troubling, is that the God that they're talking about, the God that they're portraying, is actually a God that thinks like them, that talks like them, and that would carry out things the way that they think they should be carried out. And however, what they've discovered is that they have created a God in their own image, we today have the scriptures revealed to us. We don't need to create our own God and have a God that does everything that we would do or think or say. We have a God who, praise him, is other and holy and different than we are. Where our weaknesses come through, his covers all in his fullness to completeness. 
And so as we understand God, may we understand him in light of how he has been revealed. I hope we leave here today seeing more of who the Holy Spirit is and aligning our thoughts to who he is and how he has revealed himself. Wayne Grudem, a systematic theology professor, when talking about the Holy Spirit, says that it's the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit that is on mission. Listen to these words. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make obvious and clear the active presence of God in the world, especially in the church. So do you want to know what the Spirit does in the life of unbelievers and how the Spirit works in the life of unbelievers? Do you want to know what the Spirit does in the life of believers? How does the Spirit work in and through believers? What does he do with that? Do you want to know about the gifts of the Spirit and how the the Holy Spirit gives us these gifts to utilize? you want to understand about sanctification, how the Holy Spirit helps us and sanctifies us and accomplishes the plan of our lives? I'm incredibly excited to tell you all about that next week. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that we had this opportunity to discover who you truly are in a more fuller way this morning. Father, we understand your Holy Spirit as a person, as holy, and as God as well. Father, would you help us make this mystery a a deeper reality in our hearts? Would you help us to understand the depths of this reality, and not only so that we just understand you more, but Father, we want to know you more so that we worship you fuller, so that we understand your purpose for us, that we can glorify you in greater and deeper ways. May you help us with that today. In Jesus' name, amen.